All right. Well, welcome everyone to the 18th episode to Oakland Tobacconist Live. And I, we're very excited for this particular episode we've got. It's going to be amazing. We have special guest Nick Melillo from well, Foundation Cigars. To the 18th episode to and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be offering a killer sampler. I almost call it the ultimate sampler because of what is available. And this is a very limited supply. The sampler is live now. If you go to our website and click on the link within this video, that will take you to our homepage. And that's where you're going to find it. And uh, in it, we have an amazing lineup. We have the five-year Wawense, which is the Perfecto 60 gauge. It is phenomenal. We did a tasting for this, I think, last year when it was first released. It is an amazing cigar, rich Corojo tobacco. It is it is unlike any other cigar I've had. So it is phenomenal. So you have your, your five-year Wawense. You have the Tabernacle in the Goliath and the David, a very rare release, a bit difficult to get your hands on. We were able to get both sizes in this sampler pack. If you're a fan of Connecticut Broadleaf, if you're a fan of the medium plus to full-bodied Maduro, as well as Perfecto Shape, that's what you're going to want to do with this uh, David and Goliath. And then we've got the Wise Man Maduro, the Wawense Corojo, and then the Charter Oak Connecticut. One sampler pack, one amazing price. It is on our website. So make certain that you click on the link in this video that will take you to our website, and that's where you can pick it up. We also have a lot of other of Nick's cigars in the lineup uh, available here at our shop. You can either do in-shop pickup, or you can order it and we can send it to your door. It's phenomenal. Tonight, uh, and it's been a while, unfortunately, since I've had this in our uh, shop, but I'm going to be lighting up the Wise Man Maduro. I absolutely love this cigar, San Andreas Maduro. It is phenomenal. So we're going to be having that. I see we're having a few people joining on. Foundation Cigars, greetings, everyone. Thank you again for being our guest. We have Roy Watson. Good afternoon. Uh, if you guys have any questions for Nick or myself, please drop them in the comments. I would love to uh, hear whatever questions, whether it's tobacco, whether it's about the brand, the evolution of the blends. Uh, feel free to drop them. We have uh, Chip here smoking a Goliath with a Dr. Pepper cream soda, a great non-alcoholic pairing. Um, but also, if you are smoking and enjoying a drink together, go ahead and drop them in the comments. So uh, with that, I'm actually going to light this up. It's been far too long since I've enjoyed this cigar, so I'm looking forward to this. Um, and without further ado, because we don't want to keep our guests waiting anymore, we have Nick Malillo. Please help me welcome the owner and blender of Foundation Cigars. Hello, hello. How are you, sir? Thanks for having me. Excited no. to catch up with you. Yes, man, thank you so much. Killer sampler, man. Killer sampler. We call that internally the power pack sampler. <laughs> That's the power sure. pack. I, I had to I had to somewhat dub it the ultimate sampler just because of what's in oh, it. Oh, even and, better. Yes. Yeah. And I think nice, the last man. time that we were able to talk um, was I think during COVID. I think we did uh, Instagram. IG. And, you did the IG. I yeah. see so you stepped up your game. You got you got the <laughs> mic. You got uh, small, you small got baby steps. Done. We're getting there. <laughs> that's good it's good and that I think is, last I time you remember actually... go ahead i'm so sorry i was gonna I say you were, you were smoking a pipe last time i think I, you know my trusted pipe is never too far away <laughs> you know it's it's been um over you know quarantine i have to say i've been really getting into my pipe you know it's, okay. it's especially this one this is a becker pipe uh it was made by pablo becker in rome italy it's very special because it's become my favorite pipe. This briar is such a high quality. That's that's mm -hmm. really what distinguishes the the smoking experience with pipes is the quality of the briar. If you have cheap briar, bowl gets really hot. Okay. If you have really yeah. high density, you know, high quality briar, it's nice and dense and it absorbs a lot of that that heat so it doesn't overheat. It's, you know, very similar when you're smoking your cigar. You don't want it to overheat because it changes the whole smoking experience, you know, right. in the blend. Right. So, yeah, yes. I, I awesome. can go off on pipes. I, I love pipes, <laughs> but that's a whole well, and, show. And, and as you, I mean, you've got the foundation hat. I've got the foundation hat. What I failed to uh, remark is people who order the sampler pack, we've got nine hats. So we're going to choose nine uh, uh, purchasers of the sampler to send them a foundation hat. It is great phenomenal so Listen, it's just we don't we don't go cheap on our swag we spend a decent decent amount of coin on our swag because Definitely. for me it's in, it's important to complement you know the brands with with proper right. swag so that hat 
you know, we I, I searched for a long time to find a really good hat maker. So all the hats are really high quality. So, well, um, and I'm a skater myself. So when I saw it, I was like, oh, this has got to be skating. Perfect. I can't wear that hat personally because I can't. My my noggin is too gigantic. So I finally <laughs> I started. I, I made these, you know, because a lot of a lot of lot of, some guys can't do the flat brim. Some guy everybody's got their personal preference. But right, uh, right. You know, nice. they're, they're both really sharp hats. But I love the colors scheme on the oh, hat yeah. you're wearing. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, definitely. Especially in Christmas time, it looks really nice. There you go. Well, and you're gonna have to forgive me. It's it's uh, really hot out here. We're we're in we're in uh, the upper upper hills of California here. So it, the weather's a bit warm. So if I'm shining on screen, it's just because it's a it's a bit toasty. <laughs> same here. Same here. Same here. So we got we got uh, Chip uh, dropping down saying, "Hey Nick, big fanboy. I know you have an affinity for different cultures, African, Jamaican, English. Do you have any plans to explore other cultures?" Through your cigars in the future, Japanese perhaps. Man, so do I? Ha do I plan on exploring other cultures through your cigars in the food? Yeah, I mean, I could, I could definitely see um, exploring some other cultures. Um, definitely, I think you know the richness of cultures throughout the world. There's so many amazing ones. You know, like this. Well, Wednesday. You know, well, Wednesday is a is a cultural treasure of the world. Hence, mm -hmm. it was my my first brand coming from Nicaragua. I never knew about it, and it it really makes for an amazing brand. I mean, just the color scheme. Um, yeah. You know the yeah. the name well, Wednesday is a little is a little is a mouthful, but you know, it's <laughs> so important uh, for Nicaragua as you know, really its cultural identity. But also for for the for the world, so I felt it mm -hmm. was uh, important to share that with the cigar smoking community. So I could see that happening. Yeah, Japanese man. I, I was in Japan um, once. I had the the pleasure of traveling to Japan. It's it's definitely a culture I'm not as familiar with, but it's okay. incredibly inc incredibly rich. I mean. The kings of Japan go go back a far a long time. <laughs> so um, I'd love to learn more and potentially do something. You never know. Yeah, great question. Yeah. And, and I, I've got to, and I've got to uh, congratulate you on in the year 2020. It was a big year for you. I mean, in spite of all the things happening with COVID and such like that. I mean, the releases that came out. Um, we did when we first got in the the, the trio, the Goliath, the David, the five year Wednesday. We did a tasting night for it, um, and nothing but glowing reviews. The the I would say the only negative was the question at the end of the night. So you're going to be carrying this all the time, <laughs> man. It was a tough one, man. It was a tough year because it, you know everybody knows it was a tough year. In the you know as mm -hmm. far as the releases went, you know it's our five year anniversary. I worked really hard on something special with the five year blend and also the box. Um, I mean, just the, the, the whole package. Uh -huh. So it was, luckily it was all, the blend was already done. The packaging was already, uh, you just cleared up there. It came, you came in, you're in perfect. You're in high def right now. <laughs> uh, so it was tough because we came to a point where there wasn't a lot of cigars that were ready. The boxes were taking longer than normal. Everything was taking longer than normal. So by the time October came, I only had like 500 boxes and I didn't want to wait wow. anymore because yeah. that Oct October was our true fifth year anniversary. We started shipping the last week of September, first week of October, five, five years ago, last you know September, wow. October. So I said, do I wait? So I have more, which is going to be into the next year. Yeah. Or do we try to get some to everybody with the cigars that were ready aged and the packaging that was ready? So we did our best, man, to try to get, you know, everybody. I, I'm something. happy. I'm happy you pushed it. It was it, cool. phenomenal. Yeah, it was. It's tough because, you know, you want you want everybody to enjoy it. And, you know, there's. 
man, I wish I had a lot more at the time. Um, so we are actually keeping that going for this year. It's the only time the five year is going to be available all year in limited quantities. We're hoping to have okay. more coming in next month and um, August also. So, okay. um, so it is going to be um, available for the, so we're focusing on that still for this summer instead of okay. releasing a lot of new stuff. We're going right. to keep focusing on the five year just because it was so late being released. And then the David and Goliath is going to be a consistent production run, but limited production run. So it's going to be a part of the, the tabernacle line. But as you know, perfectos are very, you got to be careful with perfectos, um, mm -hmm. you know, just because they are really difficult to roll to get the blend down. And then also the construction is definitely more challenging than regular cigars. So okay. I tend yeah. to, you know, I tend to try to get uh, the, the, the foot of the cigar, not as elongated um, because that's okay. where you can run into problems at times is yeah. what happens uh -huh. is it starts getting tight in that yeah. foot part when it's really long. And then that's when it could start running up the side you know, you, the draw can be potentially tougher. So I try to keep that down um, as okay. much as possible now, to get an easier light. Now, I know that you, you do all the blending for foundation. We, when it yeah, comes sure. to the rolling, it, it, when it starts, like at its, at its beginning, something like the David or the Goliath, have you, yeah. do you roll, did you roll the Perfecto? I didn't roll. So that's not my, my forte was be the perfecto size. So my strength is rolling, um, more without molds also. So straight, no molds, um, no real tools that because my, my experience is out of the bale, right? That's where is inspecting the tobacco and the leaf. Um, mm -hmm. so even though I know how to roll and bunch with, with molds also, the yeah. perfecto size is, uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that's my, <laughs> that's my forte uh, uh, at, okay. at all because, you know, it's really experience in doing it day in and day out, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sitting at the table day in and day out. And that's where, you know, you really get just amazing, you know, rollers and bunchers on the production floors because they're doing it eight hours a day day in and day out. And that's really what you have to do in order to get that skill level, right, you know, right, at, right. It, at its, at its height. And that's what I tell that, you know, guys, just with my experience, my experience is, you know, managing, uh, managing production, you know, managing the blends, managing yeah. the tobacco purchasing, managing the fermentation piles so overseeing that so i'm sure if i did it eight hours day in and day out <laughs> yeah i'd be able to Definitely. i'd be able to do some perfect but, but there's stuff. only one nick melillo so <laughs> I, I tell you that's gonna end up being my when i get sick of everything my retirement you're just gonna <laughs> find, i don't want to deal with emails anymore i don't want to deal <laughs> with social media you're gonna find me at a at a at a mesa on a bench just rolling cigars all day <laughs> There you go. And probably not, you know, not in quantity. That's the thing. I, <laughs> I roll again, not, in, not in quantity, you know, for more blending purposes um, and much slower than, you know, the skilled, the skilled people I work with, which are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So we got Curtis yeah. joining on. He's a regular here saying, Hey everybody. Uh, Chip has another question saying, do you have any plans for the ultimate cigar in your Ethiopian line, being that the Menelik Tabernacle, something like the Ark to round it out or something in that nature? I can't really talk about it right now. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, we got Possibly. something special. Next, this year is a big year. We got some, it's going to be an interesting year next year. We, we got some great things in the horizon. Unfortunately, just yet, uh, I can't. I can't fully talk about okay. it. Um, okay. I mean, I, I can't say I've been, I've been honored recently to, to actually, you know, sit down with um, the Ethiopian crown council. Yes. And that's awesome. Um, yeah. And it looks like this coming year, they're actually going to be awarding me the order 
of the Star of Ethiopia, okay. which is given to uh, military and civilians. It's um, for their dedication and love for Ethiopia and Ethiopian culture. So wow. Um, wow. it's like the honor of a lifetime. So it's pretty much like that's, being that's amazing. Well, congratulations. Knighted. Yeah. Which is, yeah. So that's man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it, incredible. We, we can somewhat read between the lines. I see what you're saying. Don't, I won't pressure you into giving away anything. No, but. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm just giving a little information. <laughs> well, then uh, we got a question from Josh, also regularly here at the shop. Um, and he says the Menelik is his favorite cigar. Now, when he says it, it's favorite, he's like across the board, like legit his favorite. Yeah. And uh, he's wondering what kind of inspired that blend. Uh, and if you see something similar coming down the pipeline later. Menelik, what inspired the blend, it was really something I started doing for events, right? So I started wanting to get out there and, and, and visiting some shops. So instead of just doing your, your typical thing, I just made the Menelik up as something that I carried with me to events. Okay. And then eventually it became a 12 count box. It's got some similarities to the Wiseman Maduro. It's yeah, got yeah. Uh, a little bit more Lijero and, and heavier Viso in the blend comparatively to the Wise Man. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that's been on the market, excuse me, um, had some really long age on them. Um, okay. So they did tone down a little bit and, and round out. Also, the 12 count boxes now, whatever is out there right now, um, you don't have any. Do you have some in stock? Not, we normally stock yeah, it, but we, it's been a little difficult to get a hold we, of. We haven't had it. Um, <laughs> it. We haven't had it. We haven't had it since um, last year. So we're hoping um, also next month okay. to be okay. getting some Menelix out also. So Well, and I, I had mentioned last year doing a tasting night of the five-year. Um, so the tasting night essentially is we choose a really special cigar, and then yeah. we get uh, something special to pair it with, and it's a ticketed event where we try it all together and we pair the drink together. Well, Menelik was the first tasting night we ever did here at the shop. It was our opener. Oh, cool. And it's a 12 count box. We had like 12 people. That was like spots are really limited, but I mean, it's phenomenal. It became a usual in our shop whenever I get my hands on it. Cool. Keep a, keep in touch with, with, um, with Alex in our office for next yeah. month, we should okay. be getting some in um, next month. I'm actually just waiting um, on that, so hopefully we'll, we'll get some, a dose in for next definitely, month. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, and I know, I know, it's, it's some amongst your peers in the industry, I've heard people talk about you saying that you have an interesting relationship with tobacco, and uh, and 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 that being like how how deep you delve into it, if you don't mind, just kind of giving us a, a quick like snapshot of what started the evolution of Nick Melillo into tobacco and sort of where you landed in foundation. Yeah, definitely my you know my grandfather, right? You know when you're you're a young man growing up and you you look up to your you know your parents and your your my grandfather, both my grandfathers. I looked up to, um, unfortunately, my dad's father passed away when I was sophomore in high school. Okay. And my mom's uh, father, who was also the pipe smoker, he just passed away last year. He was he was 94. Yeah. But having a cigar, you know, with my grandfather was like a coming of age ceremony. Okay. You know, it's like the first yeah. time you sit down and, and you know, you, you you, you can't have a cigar. You can't have a cigar. You see it. You love the aroma. I grew up around, you know, pipes, ar aroma, and Connecticut broadleaf, and just always loved it and associated, of course, really great memories. Right. So being right. able to sit down with my grandfather, you know, for the first time when I was eighteen, and and, and have a cigar with him, just definitely yeah. set it off. And then I really started to do a deep dive from there. Being from Connecticut, you know, that's it's one of the coolest things being from Connecticut is our cigar tobacco history and, and culture here in the state. So I really started getting into that because it's like, oh man, I'm from Connecticut and you know, Connecticut rap, you, you start hearing Connecticut. Um, right, right. You know, it's like one of the coolest yeah. things moving to Nicaragua when I was 
24 and you know i'm around all cubans and legends in this industry and nicaraguan legends and they asked they don't they edis where are you from connecticut <laughs> connecticut connecticut they all know connecticut you know it was like the first time where you're like wow connecticut is you know because you always want to get out of your at least being yeah, yeah. you want to get the hell out you know, <laughs> and, you know when you're young so i'm going off on tangents man i i forgot no, no. where we were going yeah so I, I just got into it man i just you know from there i started getting into the history of connecticut and why connecticut and then the indigenous you know cultures that use tobacco for so long and it's mm -hmm. it's really right. difficult because a lot of that you know a lot of the information was lost um or destroyed but uh, yeah that always that always fascinated me is okay that that history in connecticut and you know i i talk about this often so i, I apologize if it's a repeat for uh no repeat no listeners but Connecticut is a, is a corrupt form of the Mohegan word, which means alongside the great tidal river. So the, okay. the Connecticut river is 406 miles long. And if you look at a map in the Northeast corner of New Hampshire, you'll find two lakes, Lake Connecticut one and Lake Connecticut two. And the river okay. really starts right on the border of Canada and then flows south it's really the border between new hampshire and vermont cuts through massachusetts into the north of connecticut above hartford sort of bears east and then empties okay. into the long island sound so if you look into the history of that in the end of the last glacier period that was actually a huge lake after the glacier started to recede so it was actually called lake hitchcock it was a okay. gigantic finger lake so that huge lake, eventually part of it broke and then started funneling into south into the Long Island Sound. But when it broke, the lake bed, the sand and, and the loam from the, the lake settled in 30,000 acres north of Hartford. And we oh, call wow. this Windsor soil. Okay. So it's, it's that soil that makes for great black tobacco we call cigar tobacco as opposed okay. to blonde and burleys for you know cigarette grades and it's really because of the filtration of water that the sandy loam wow. provides yeah so it's that sand acts as a natural filter before it hits deep down into clay so the okay. roots of the plant are they it wants to find water right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they're searching really deep before it latches onto that clay whereas if you had a ton of clay all that water would build up, right? It wouldn't flow right. deep, and you get the roots going sort of out, and uh -huh. so that really provided really great soil in the locks of the river for growing cigar tobacco. And okay. you know, in the 1600s, um, a lot of the Dutch explorers first came into Connecticut and and New York, and the Dutch started trading tobacco very early on. There was a uh, an explorer by the name of Adrian Block, and many know people out east here know Block Island, which is an island off the coast of uh, Long Island and in Connecticut, Rhode Island, which it was named after him because he was the first one that started traveling up the Connecticut River and seeing tobacco being used by the indigenous tribes. And okay. then from there, the Dutch still to this day are very involved in the tobacco trade throughout the world. Okay. Um, now, yeah. now, now, as you're talking about Connecticut um, and you're saying yeah. black tobacco, cigar tobacco, um, yeah. and we all we've all heard, oh, yeah, that's a Connecticut cigar or Connecticut seed. So yeah. a lot of like Connecticut shade, is that completely spawning from Connecticut? Yeah, so we can get into this. Let's get into it. So <laughs> so let, let me let me try to explain this as, as simply as possible. So you have different seed varieties. Right, right that are right. are grown traditionally in Connecticut. I'll give you the whole backstory. So traditionally you have broadleaf has been grown here for a long time. There are some stories that part of the broadleaf seed actually came from Maryland. Um, okay. and part of it was indigenous. There was a tobacco here called shoestring tobacco. Um, so again, some of these things can be debatable. I'll just share what, what I have learned right, over the years. Right. So in the end of the late 1800s, um, you had the Dutch trading 
tobacco also in Sumatra in Indonesia. Okay. And what yeah. the Dutch were finding through their trade in Indonesia, Sumatra, is that a lot of the tobacco, again, the tobacco is not indigenous even to that part of the world, but they brought the seeds and the jungles would shade a lot of the tobacco. So they weren't getting direct sunlight. Okay. So they start, the Dutch started producing amazing wrapper grade tobacco, right? In order to grow wrapper, which is the most difficult to really grow because you need the right conditions. You know, mm -hmm. it's very silky. The vein structure is much thinner. The cellular yeah. walls of the leaf are much thinner. So they started really destroying other wrapper growing regions, which one was Connecticut, broadleaf, completely different okay. yield. It's right. heavier, it's thicker, right. not really as prized by manufacturers because from a manufacturing standpoint, as far as yields and, you know, producing cigars, it's much more difficult. Yeah. So they, so they start really destroying. So um, the, a lot of the, the wrapper sales here and a lot of people started gearing towards Sumatra wrapper. Right. So in response to that, the Department of Agriculture started experimenting with what we call the experiment station here in Connecticut, okay. which was originally in New Haven, um, where I'm from in Connecticut. And they started uh, experimenting with hybridizing different seeds. And over a period of time, they hybridized Sumatra, okay, broadleaf, and Cuban seed. And that gave birth to Connecticut shade. Really? Yes. Okay. That's where Connecticut shade comes from. Now, through now, this experimentation, this whole other leaf is yeah. born. And then to mimic the jungles and the shade, yeah. this gentleman had the brilliant idea of covering the fields with a cheesecloth tent to mimic the shade so the light is filtered through the tent. Okay. Which creates a microclimate under the tent, moisture content, humidity is about 10% higher, it's hotter, it produces the environment to grow more of a wrapper grade tobacco. So so hence the name Connecticut Shade, because when the hybrid came about, they had to grow it under shade. It just took on that name. Say again. I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, so like it's so it's Connecticut Shade, um, and it, it got that name because to create it and to create the consistency they wanted, they decided, okay, we're yeah. gonna do cheesecloth to mimic Correct. the jungle. jungle because it's okay. different. It's completely different when it's grown direct sunlight. You don't yeah. get that gold, yeah. that golden color that we all know Connecticut Shade, right? From so yes, that's where now, it got the now, name. Now, if you were to take that same seed and not grow it under the shade, would it be as thin of a leaf? No. no. Okay. Because okay. that sun exposure is everything, right? It, right. How much right. sun? Because then the leaf starts building up. Resi it's, it's, it's like us in our skin getting tan almost. It starts building up resistance to all of the, the light coming to it. So the same okay. thing can happen with the tobacco. And this is why, uh, and it also has to greatly to do also with the soil, right? Because yeah, right. again, and, and that's why Nicaragua is known for it, its amazing filler tobaccos. There, there's a lot of wrappers now being grown under shaded tents in Nicaragua. That's a, that's yeah. a whole nother um, right, story. Right, right. But the fillers are getting that sunlight okay. in Nicaragua and it, it, most active volcanoes in Central America. So you have this rich, amazing volcanic black yeah. soil that is yeah. just making for rich, amazing, flavorful, flavorful tobacco. Okay. So, so then was it a natural progression from going to, okay, Connecticut shade is created in Connecticut. And then, well, Ecuador has got this cloud coverage. Let's just take okay. it over here. So, so that's early 1900s, 1910, Connecticut shade starts coming. It ends up becoming a hit. I mean, Connecticut shade now is Connecticut starts growing tons into the four after the war into the fifties. Yeah. There's, um, you know, in the forties, um, you know, it, it really started to boom also. And, you know, everybody was at the war, but there was still a, a demand to send cigars over there. Um, so it, it really started to really rule and, 
you have so many acres of shade being grown and that's really where Connecticut, you know, starts becoming really well known in the, in the cigar industry. And then you also have broadleaf. So you're having this light, thin, right right wrap and then you also are getting this other completely dark rich <laughs> vein structure you know and then you have the cuban seed which is a whole nother story but okay. let me i'll bring you up to present day because it's interesting what happened connecticut shade connecticut shade mm -hmm. and then in the 80s coincidentally enough the dutch started getting involved in ecuador and some seeds from Connecticut were brought to Ecuador. Okay. And since the eighties until now have pretty much taken on a good portion of the Connecticut shade growing. Wow. Ecuador in certain fields and certain areas has this n natural cloud cover during growing season. It's not these big puffy clouds. I forgot the actual scientific name for these clouds. They're very thin and light yeah. and they yeah. act as a shade and Ecuador started getting incredible yields okay. from the shade plant and yeah. to a point where Connecticut eventually till now has been unable to compete with the shade because of that. Okay. Cause of the acreage uh, and the natural, the, the yeah. acreage cost of labor up here, but also the yields per plant, you know, the amount of labor that it, takes to go into growing them here in Connecticut. So naturally shade has sort of shifted. Um, okay. you do. And, th but then broadleaf is the opposite story, right? right. Now. We can't, we can't grow enough broadleaf. Yeah. You know, shade is very thin. Yeah. It's much more, I would say, again, I'm, I'm generalizing. It's a little bit more neutral in okay. flavor. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. thick. It's very thin. Whereas, so you can, you, they, they were able to get away and you're able to get away with that in the blending process to shift to say Ecuador. And then the market accepted it. Okay. Right? Cause a lot of yeah. times people, use, people are using Connecticut shade and it is from Ecuador. Connecticut never really protected the name, which is, you know, un maybe fortunate, unfortunate, <laughs> but uh, broadleaf, you can't really replicate in that way. You well, know, and I've, I've, really, I've heard I've heard people yeah. experimenting with trying to do Nicaraguan really broadly. A lot of experimentation, Honduras, everybody, because that's all being driven by the mass market. Yeah, because yeah. the mass market, that whole machine-made market, yeah. legalization of cannabis it has been moved to natural leaf and okay, blunt products. So more and more people are smoking you know, natural leaf style products yeah. and broadleaf for that market is really good because it's naturally sweet. Okay. Yeah. And, but, but a lot of places, you know, the, the consumer is not as distinguished as we are. So, you know, <laughs> you're paying 99 cents, you know, it's like, so they were able to shift to Pennsylvania broadleaf. They're able to shift yeah. to Honduras broadleaf. They're able to shift Whereas I'm sure a, a number of consumers can notice or may notice, but it yeah. hasn't been enough to really shake because the market is just growing. So right, insane. right. Well, and yeah. and it's 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 interesting that you bring up Pennsylvania broadleaf, um, and I I would love to hear you expand on this because a lot of times I get the question, well, what's the difference between Pennsylvania and Connecticut broadleaf? To me, for my palate, it seems to be that Pennsylvania tends to be more rustic, more like heavy hitting in a way. Whereas it doesn't have that yeah. creamy sweetness that some of the Connecticut broadleaf has. I, I tend to agree with that. And that's, that's definitely to me, the natural sweetness, although, you know, I, I think it has been changing. And again, I, I always judge, you know, what I know is based on experience. Yeah. Um, my experience is definitely more with Connecticut broadleaf, of course. Um, but my, you know, initially that's definitely the experience I get from Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, is that gritty? They are also experimenting with a lot of different seed varieties and, you know, there are different, different seeds and it has gotten a little bit sweeter for some of the Pennsylvania, but again, it's still not, you know, it's not, you can't replicate that Valley. You know? Right. It's right. It's, it's just yeah. not the same, you know? Yeah. It's, it comes back to that soil that you were talking about. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
So okay. it's, um, you know, there's some characteristics that are similar, but I, I'm definitely biased. <laughs> Well, and, and I mean, as you were speaking to experience, I mean, really with opening a cigar shop and really just where my palate started with the, it, it's an honest thing. When I think Connecticut Broadleaf, I can't think of that tobacco without thinking of Nick Melillo, whether it was early incarnations of, of Drew Estate or, or now foundation, like just, just really understanding that tobacco. It's, it always harkens back to Tabernacle. Or it harkens back to something that you, you have your hands on. Um, it's a tasty treat. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just love it too. So, you know, it's my, it's me tierra. I say it's my land, you know, so I, <laughs> I have an affinity to it. And, you know, I, I just know that that yeah. aroma and the tobacco just, just really well. And it's, um, you know, for me, it's very much a part of the company, you know, uh, the, the, the soul of what foundation that Connecticut Nicaragua connection is definitely yeah. really important for foundation. So yeah. my, you so, know, my goal is to bring that awareness continually because to, to non-smokers even more, because we really do have in Connecticut, the Napa Valley of cigar tobacco in the river Valley. And okay. I think, I, I think that's so important on many, many levels to the state. Yeah. To people but also to non-smokers alike you know i think right. it's important when I, and i so, know you i mean even the history behind the the name charter oak and 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 with that and with the with the tree and during the revolutionary period i mean it's just it's it's woven into all the blends of foundation especially charter oak man yeah that's a connecticut quickly becoming a connecticut classic <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I, yeah so for those those watching, uh, if you haven't heard so far, we have a killer, the ultimate foundation sampler, which includes Nick's five year will Wednesday, the David and the Goliath Tabernacle incarnations, as well as the uh, Wise Man Maduro and, and the Charter Oak, Connecticut. If you'd like to pick up the sampler, click on the link in this video. It directs you to our website. That's where you can find it. Um, but a question I would have for my own curiosity is, what would you say is a some of the distinctions between your Tabernacle, let's say Toro? the traditional that you started with and something like the, the Goliath or the David, like is the blends, do they vary? They do vary. So they're, they're, they're definitely tweaked according to the size. There's a little bit difference in the, in the filler tobaccos um, okay. ba based on the size. So, you know, they're similar, but they're definitely, definitely, you know, everything in my opinion, you know, especially different sizes, they have to be blended out. You know, it's not yeah, just something yeah. that you can just kind of one size fits all because they're so different each, each size. Right, so, right. And you can go in different directions um, yeah. with the blends sometimes. So there is a, a, a combination of filler tobaccos that are tweaked for the blend, but they're definitely uh, similarities to the broadleaf blend. Yeah, so yeah. Hopefully, um, you know, at some point, Probably next next year, later next year, you might see uh, some Tabernacle Havana seed uh, perfectos yeah. coming out. Yeah. Well, and 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 I mean the the story of the Havana seed itself is is an interesting. I mean, you have that that number on the end, one forty two. Like, what was the process yeah. of creating the Havana seed blend? So there's different seed varieties within the valley that people grow, right? So brought, when you're talking to different farmers, different farmers have different seed varieties that they have used or worked on, or they've worked on with the experiment station here in Connecticut, which is, you know, the experiment station works with farmers to help strengthen seeds, you know, because the ultimate goal is to, you know, how do we, we make sure that crops don't get destroyed, they're resistant mm -hmm. to disease, and you get, get better yields because that's in, that's in the interest of the Department of Agriculture and the experiment mm -hmm. station. You know, they want to see right. farming farming do well. So one of the um, plagues of um, growing in the valley is, is, is black shank, and also okay. you have blue molds. Right, so right. Havana seed was typically uh, susceptible to black, black shank a lot. Okay. So the 142 seed variety was, was, it was developed to strengthen 
the resistance against black okay. uh, black snakes. So you have some farmers that will use that. Some use another variety, which is called Type Fifty Two, okay. which is another variety, which is generally yeah. how yeah. you know broadleaf okay. is classified as Type Fifty One tobacco in the valley. That's more okay. of a scientific human seed Type Fifty Two, and then you have all these sub sub seeds that are you know again Havana seed. Um, I think. Pepin uses one for one of his projects. Um, it's like HK. Again, another seed variety, but it's all Cuban seed that was brought to the Connecticut River Valley in the 1870s is, is what I tracked it down to. Um, Co ten, Corojo yeah. tobacco has a similar problem, right? Corojo, Corojo was like yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, it's more. That's why a lot of people grow Criollo um, especially in Nicaragua filler, because it is more, uh, resistant to different diseases in the field. Okay. Okay. Um, so there is experiments. I brought up, um, some Corojo seed and Corojo seed to the Valley back in like 2014, um, okay. 15. So there's, there's experiments going on, um, have been yeah. going on. So, and, and I think it's great. I think that's one thing that the Valley lacked over so many years was people got really complacent on the strength of the Connecticut shade market. It was on top of the world. Mm. Um, the, the, what led into the development of the Connecticut shade was competition from abroad and then innovation. And I felt like things kind of slowed down because we were really on top of the world there mm -hmm. for you know 50s, 60s. And then, you know, I think nobody thought it would decline. Then you had an older generation that kind of went, went out. A lot of them got older. They weren't into, you know, all the taxes and the regulations and all right, these things. So right. a lot of people, but I'm, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of farmers. You know, I had someone yesterday who said, oh, I thought, you know, nobody was really growing anymore. And I thought this was on the decline and this. No, there's some really committed farmers, you know, and, yeah, and people. Yeah. Um, and as long as I'm around, I'm, I'm just always about promoting the Valley, um, you know, just overall. Right. Because I think it's it's really important, especially for the well, state. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you can also see that within the type of tobaccos that you use. I mean, because it's like it seems like there's always a, there's a there's a hard press on a broadleaf shortage. And then you have Havana seed 142. You don't choose the the average easygoing. I'm going to have this tobacco always available. <laughs> Dude, it's tough, man. That's this is the reason why a lot of people you know haven't used broadleaf over the years for the premium side. See, it's more it's much easier to use on the mass market side because the leaves get gigantic and you can cut yeah. in between the veins. Um, okay. Do you have a sec? You, hold on one second. Do you mind sure. if I let me just not, grab not this? This is not exactly, um, this is a broadleaf seed grown in another place. I can't really tell you right now where, but uh, <laughs> this is a, we got a, wow. So this is not a great leaf. You know, when you're cutting um, for, for the mass market cigars, I don't know if you can see this well. Yeah, with the you know this you can cut in between these veins. Okay, and that's and you're getting a lot of yield when you're cutting in between these veins. Whereas us for the premium market, we need to cut this way yeah, across the right. vein. Right, it makes it a lot a lot more challenging when it comes to the production floor and yield. And yeah, so you know, especially if you're smaller, you know, manufacturing. Because what happens is you, you end up getting the whole cow. You're going to get filler. You're going to get binder. But you got to have a home for all of it also. Right, right. You know? Yeah, So yeah. And then if you don't want the rest of it, then the price of the wrapper starts going way up. Right, right. So it's – from a manufacturing standpoint, it is, it, it's much more of a challenge. And you haven't even thrown in the fermentation time that it takes – so before yeah. you're you're even ready to use it, you know you're in a two year fermentation process, sometimes longer. If you want to do it right, there's many tricks to do it quick. Yeah, right, right. You can get right. those temperatures up. 
you can get it done pretty quick. But, you know, if you want to maintain the flavor, mm -hmm. you got to do it the right way. So, right. Well, we got, we got a process. We got a few questions here. I got to get them in is uh, actually sure. Curtis here asks that um, it's clear that your packaging design has a visual uh, uh, that the visual art is something that matters to you and when and how did you develop that interest? So when you're thinking up labels and such like that. So say, say one more time. I'm sorry, Eric. So, so it's like, it's, it's, it's clearly that your, your uh, labeling and your packaging yeah. has, a, is a high priority. And so how did that interest develop? Um, and where, where exactly did that come from? Listen, for me, you know, I was behind the scenes at my previous company at DE. I didn't work on the packaging side. It was strictly production, tobacco, blending. So I've always been a lover of, of art and you know print been pretty creative so for me starting my own company it was really exciting to be able to complement the blends that i'm yeah. making with yeah. artwork that right. complements the blend so that's how i see the packaging and okay and and the art is it's to me it's a complement to these blends that I'm so passionate about. Yeah, so, yeah. um, you know, my, my art director is Alex Garcia has been a friend of mine, uh, from Esteli since, you know, for the past 18 years now, I can't believe it's that long. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we would, we, we really connected on, on many levels and been friends, you know, for a long time. And he's just an incredible creative guy. Um, you know, self-taught himself, you know, graffiti, right. Um, di right. different techniques and then Photoshop. And, you know, when I started getting into, we, we worked on a bunch of, um, uh, we would do in the, uh, as a side project, we had a, a little t-shirt company going there for a while and just okay. thinking, you know, cre creative things. I've always kind of behind, behind the scenes been working on some creative projects. So of course it just made sense when I start in the company that, you know, working with Alex to create, you know, that vision of what I right. wanted. So we really well, both started it, studying, you know. And the crazy thing about some of the artwork, some of the labeling, I mean, you open the Menelik box and it's just, I mean, the, the backside is beautiful and you're like, wow, this is stands out. And then you come out with a five year will Wednesday and people are saying like, hey, is that box for sale? Like, like the, the piece of art within that box itself. Amazing. That, that box, yeah, and that box, I mean, that box is unlike any box I've ever seen. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I call it the Voltron box. Um, <laughs> it's actually based on an old um, an old Cuban box that a, a good friend of mine had said me, this is the open box. So, you yep, know, yep. you have the two side boxes, and then it folds down. I mean, so you can't even... It, it's it's such a cool box. It, um, it is a great box. <laughs> and, you know, Alex just killed it on the graphics and really, you know, hit it out of the ballpark. And, you know, f I think sometimes people are, you know, people can go both ways. They really don't care about the packaging as the cigar. Get, you know, we start with the cigar. That's where everything starts. Right, is right. Tobacco, that's the root. That's the cornerstone. Uh, but for me, it, it's really a passion, you know, to work yeah. with Alex. Yeah. It's it's really cool to see how where things start and then where they evolve. And uh, right. I'm definitely like the orchestrator, you know, <laughs> and and Alex really does an amazing job manifesting, you know, these these ideas. So yeah, it's, uh, definitely, definitely, yeah. And well, uh, we got some cool guys also working with us on the art team that are doing animations for our um, Infuse brand, the Upsetters, mm -hmm. um, which we're going to make into a little short film too. So it's it's great to be, you know, I, I yeah. get a great joy out of the creative side. So it, it, it gives you a break from the emails and the social media and all that. <laughs> it does. And it's also very, you know, it is really challenging to get something from the concept and the idea and then into physical reality and all the steps that it takes from the boxes to the, you know, printing that inside piece to the bands, to the cellophane, to the, right, you right. know, it, it's really right. a, a amazing. Um, sometimes people, I think they, they think it happens by magic, 
but uh, <laughs> it's in a way it's magic, but it's a, it's quite the process. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Well, no. And it, it, I mean, it turns out great. It turns out great. We have a Thank you. twofold question from uh, chip here saying um, one, why is Ecuador so big on wrapper, but not as much on other cigar leaf parts, that being binder and filler. Um, yeah. And then also, he wants to know when you're coming out to California to OGT, he'll buy your plane ticket to make it happen. <laughs> Long haul chip, man. You're the man. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, again, with the Ecuador is because of the cloud cover and the sun exposure. That That's that's the main. So you don't get really thick, heavy tobacco. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you don't get filler. That's what you need for filler, right? If you want to get flavor. Um, I mean, it's great to grow mild tobacco leaves also, but in order to, to really get, you know, flavor, that's why Nick, again, Nicaragua has become Nicaragua, right? If we go right. back 20 years ago, nobody, you know, and Nicaragua went through a lot of, a lot of turmoil in the, you know, late seventies, eighties, and really just started to come out of it in the early nineties, but sun exposure, soil, yeah. most okay. active volcanoes rich the difference is let me try to explain this as simple as possible the difference between nicaragua is that the lower primings of the plant to the upper primings are so diverse so what i mean you know for those that that don't know the the bottom leaves are the mildest middle medium and then the top is where your strength is at right right yeah because the whole plant is growing to the sun right mm -hmm. and it wants mm -hmm. to flower we end up trimming, you know, topping the flower. So then all the energy goes into the leaves. Nicaragua, yeah. the bottom leaves compared to the top, the range of strength and diversity is unbelievable. Okay. Compared to say Dominican. And again, I'm not saying anyone's bad or worse. Uh, right. I don't right. see tobaccos like that, but the Dominican Ligero, their strongest is maybe like the Nicaraguan Viso, the middle. Okay. Of it. Okay. So if that can give it same with Cuba, Cuba doesn't yeah. get that really heavy, thick. They they call it medio tiempo, which is the very, very top corona part of, of the leaf. That's their strongly, but they don't even get that range and diversity from the lower priming. Okay. And I'm speaking right. general now, right? We're talking right. this all also right, depends right, right. on seed variety on farms yeah, and location exactly. and all this stuff, but Generally, that would be my feedback, you know, from from my experience. This is what okay. makes Nicaragua so sought after now, as far as filler tobaccos. Yeah, you know, so many years other countries have used Nicaraguan filler tobaccos because it gives you that fuerteza, that that strength, that that body um, yeah. to the fillers. Yeah. And you okay, know, so every, toba every tobacco. Oh. I'm sorry to cut you off. Is no, is, no, is unique. Mm -hmm. I don't see things as better and worse and oh, that's this, that, you know, right. you put, everything has its own characteristic. What makes it better or worse is your quality control standards, your growing practices, you know, how much love and passion you put into it. That's what really, but everything is an ingredient and depending on, on how you use it can be, you know, very used, you know, very flavorfully. Yeah. That's a word. Yeah. No, 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 Definitely. So, okay, I've heard this debate many, many times, and I would like to know your take on it. Is, I can't wait. <laughs> is that a lot of people say that the highest percentage of flavor comes from the wrapper leaf. Would you say I that, love this debate. Yeah. <laughs> would this would generally... Say that's true? Yeah. yeah. So I would say, yeah, depending on the ring gauge also... Okay depends on how much flavor you're going to get. So if you're smoking, excuse me, a Lancero, you're going to be getting a lot more of the wrapper flavor because of the yeah. ring gauge. It right. also depends right. on the blend, right? This mm -hmm. is, again, I'm, t I'm speaking generally speaking. If you increase right. the ring gauge, that, that percentage is going to start to change. Um, it's definitely an important part right. of the, the blend. But for me, every tobacco that's going in there is very important. And mm -hmm. if you take the blends, you know, the found, if you switch anything out, you're going to end up having a whole different animal. Um, yeah. The wrapper is very important. It's what you visually see. Mm -hmm. It's what's it's it's the icing on the cake. Man. Right. That's really the, that's it's, really it's what the it dress. Is. It's the dress on the woman. 
as I've heard it said before. Uh -huh. Well, that's what, it, yeah, I was saying that about our High Clare Castle because, you know, our High Clare Castle at Vardian, which is the Connecticut shade there, I would say it's, it's really, the Connecticut shade is the evening gown. It's beautiful. It's elegant. Very nice to look at. But underneath is a Brazilian Modafina binder, uh, mm -hmm. which really is holding all the good stuff together. <laughs> and that's that black lace Victoria's Secret. You know, that, that, that's <laughs> under that dress that's holding all the goodness together. And and everything's a part of it, you know. Every yeah. yeah, you know, for me, every 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 line is an album and every size is a track. Mm -hmm. And they're all, you know, sing a different song. And and, um, and and with that you you have to supplement leaves with combustion and, and, and flavor and such like that. Whoa, yeah, that's a whole, yeah, that's number, numero uno. You, you got to make sure these tobaccos have the right combustion. Um, <laughs> that's so, yeah, I, I've seen some disasters over the years. Yeah. <laughs> you got to make sure. Well, and, and yeah. so what's it like when you're like, okay, I'm going to create a blend. I'm going to go ahead and blend this together, especially let's, let's rewind the clock five years ago and you're, you're going to release the first way Wednesday blend. Like, was yeah. there a, a was there a whole slew of trial and error of what you wanted the blend to be? Did you have a clear thought of I want it to be Corojo? Like what what did that I look did. like? I did. I that look, you know, that specifically I knew I wanted to do 100% Nicaraguan blend. You know, it's like I I've, I've been living in Nicaragua. Nicaragua has become a part of me as my first release. I want 100% Nicaraguan blend. I want to okay. represent what Nicaraguan tobacco is all about. So to have a yeah. filler binder and wrapper that's 100% Nicaraguan, you know, the wrapper in Nicaragua ha is more difficult to grow because you're dealing with the sun exposure. So you yeah. have to grow it more under the shaded tents to even get yields that make sense to even <laughs> begin to attempt to grow it. And then it's generally been, you know, up until recently, you know, I would say in the past really five years, you have much more experimentation with, with shade wrapper. And a lot of it is being, some of it is being geared towards the mass market uh, consumption yeah. also. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's been a challenge. It's, it's taken, t you know, many years for Nicaragua to really get these wrappers um, to a place where they are, I mean, um, yeah. some unbelievable wrappers coming out of Nicaragua. Okay. So, I knew I wanted to work with um, that wrapper as my first blend. And then I okay. knew I wanted to pay tribute to Nicaragua. Yeah. You know, this place that has become a part of me through, you know, and again, the Wawense, it doesn't matter what political affiliation you come from, what religious affiliation you come from. Every Nicaraguan, you know, has seen the Wawense or can identify you know, well, Wednesday as, as yeah. distinct, distinctly Nicaraguan. So, right. And what, my friend it, Dion Giolito was down at the beginning, okay. you know, yeah. Dion and from I, Illusion. from Illusion. Yeah. Dion really helped me, you know, when I was first start starting and um, he gave me part of his booth the first year at the trade show and, um, you know, working with him, and I had been working with the guys from Aganorsa since 2003 because I had purchased so much filler style tobaccos, um, so a lot of fillers from that, from them over the years. So I, I was less experienced with working with the wrapper and always wanted to work with the wrapper. Okay. Um, yeah, so and hence, yeah. well, Wednesday was born. And that's, yeah. you know, that's, I just started with that. It was total just love man i wasn't even thinking <laughs> business you know i wasn't yeah, yeah. you know and well wednesday i knew was going to be difficult for people especially on the american market even if you speak spanish well wednesday is a is a difficult word to pronounce because it's it's nicaragua it's it's mm -hmm. Nahuatl from nicaragua it's you know that is the root of culture is language mm -hmm. so when, when it's, Alex, it's really yeah well, I was going to say, it's really funny because uh, Dave Garofalo at Two Guys Cigars in New Hampshire, is you yeah, probably heard this you. before. Yeah, he was, our, he was our first guest on our live like, Get YouTube series. Get out of here. And, and he, he yeah, was. Listen, I just got to grab my water. I'm listening to you. No worries. No Go worries. And it, it's yeah. just it's funny to hear him talk about Wednesday because he was like, it took me Come three on. years to figure out 
how to pronounce this word. And then Nick changes it to wise man Maduro. He's like, why didn't we start with this? <laughs> so, you know, wise man, I, and it was also because of FDA, you know, stuff too. So I wanted to register multiple brands. I, I obviously knew it was going to be a mouthful for people, but I knew all, Nicaragua was watching it, you know? So, yeah. and I knew I had to do it justice you know, and then I knew, you know, as you see after that project, you know, things became a little bit more easy to pronounce Tabernacle, Charter Oak, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm aware that well, Wednesday was, but for me as a first project, as a first blend, as a first brand that, you know, I, I worked, I worked on the branding and the everything. Mm -hmm. I just had a, I just had a, my, my artistic side I had to, to be true <laughs> to and right. And, and I also knew that nobody, nobody knew who I was at that time. You know, foundation was, was not even on, on people's radars. Nobody knew who I was or where I was coming from or my experience in the industry, except for a smaller group of really hardcore consumers and yeah. cigar shops throughout the country. So I knew they were the target market for me mm -hmm. you know i knew they would be the ones that would have more uh, chance to appreciate what i was doing and that it yeah. wasn't just about totally about business or totally about like right this right. is this is this is love for a country and a love for for the industry and right right so i, ju I just went i just went with it <laughs> well and, fortunately and, and, we're and, still here yeah, there you are five years later. And I mean, and I know I've heard you in other podcasts and such speak on like some of the trade shows, which is is totally makes sense and such. But I will say on our side, like you, you said that Dion helped you share a booth. We went to TPE this at the beginning or I should say about a month and a half ago. Um, and that was one of the big letdowns is that I was like, oh, man, Nick and Foundation's not going to be there. Yeah. And, I mean, we're looking forward to 2022 and how that continues. But um, Yeah, we're not going to the PCA either this year. Right, um, right. It was just, it's just been a crazy, crazy year. And I put so much into these trade booths. I mean, and yeah, yeah. some people, I mean, the TP for us was a, a last second. Um, mm -hmm. Last year, you know, before COVID. And Dion, if it wasn't for Dion, I wouldn't have been there, really. Um, and Illusion and, and Brian from Illusion, I, those guys, I can't even begin to tell you, you know, how much of a support they've been to me. And, um, you know, I go all out with the PCA tr trade booth and it takes me, you know, my whole team down in Nicaragua, a lot of it is, is developed in Nicaragua and designed in Nicaragua. So it's, um, it's tough not going this year because I, I started at the PCA. I love the mm -hmm. PCA. It's our trade association. So, um, yeah, I like to put on a show, you know, it's like you come to a trade show. I just don't want to put a table skirt down and a sign, right. you know, a sign. It's like you're converging there. I really want people to feel what we're, we're about, you know, yeah. what, what, yeah. what the, the company is about what the brands are about and right i can't go i can't go half <laughs> throttle you know it's no no i understand yeah, yeah. well and we, we have another i have to voice this question from chip because he's talked sure. about this several times about a blend he said can you blend a cigar with connecticut broadleaf omatepe and matafina or would that be too strong or overpowering with using that combination of tobacco, yeah, broadleaf, Ometepe, and uh, Matafina. Mm -hmm. No, you, I, I don't, I don't know if I would do it all. You know, Ometepe would be your filler. You know, I don't, I don't know if I would do it all Ometepe. Um, Matafina is one of my favorite tobaccos. Broadleaf is one of my favorite tobaccos. Both, you know, broadleaf and Matafina are heavier, darker tobaccos, but they have phenomenal combustion. Okay. Even at the early early stages, they have phenomenal combustion. But okay. you, you most likely, you're gonna you, you're definitely gonna have to go with a little uh, more filler tobaccos to really um, okay make that happen. You know, you make that happen. But you know, I, I I can't say I actually have tried um, you know an all Ometepe blend with Matafina and Broadleaf. So. I, I don't want to say it couldn't completely work, but 
it might be a little bit sharp on the flavor and a little bit okay. one di one dimensional. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Even though Ometepe okay. is, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, the, if anybody gets a chance, you go look at Ometepe on Google Earth or it's, <laughs> I mean, two, two volcanic islands in the middle of Lake Nicaragua. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So, so a few questions I normally ask a lot of our, our, our guests that we have on the show, manufacturers, blenders, et cetera. Uh, one would be if you're coming up with a new blend, is there a particular size that you like to blend to? Six by 52. Okay. 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 Have you heard this from other people? Six by 52? Um, I've heard, I've heard like general, like Toro size. Um, I've oh, heard six. like Corona size. Listen, they're always, you know, usually typically you're rolling out of bales. That's really where you're starting. You're, you're rolling what we call tabacchiados, which is, you know, you're inspecting bales. You're rolling just of that one leaf from the bale to really get a sense of it. Um, many tobaccos, just by the aroma, depending on the farmer, you know, you're really picking up so much that's from aroma, right? I mean, okay. that's, yeah, this is where aroma and your olfactory comes in, you have millions of receptors there. It's such a crucial part to really, you know, understanding tobacco more um, onto the, like that next next level. Um, where were we going? Oh, but, oh, oh, the size. So yeah. six by 52 in 1996, when I started, six by 52 was my size. Okay. Always six by 52. Yeah. That was for me, Six by fifty two was a perfect representation lengthwise, ring gauge wise, of the blends. Okay. That was my personal personal yeah. um, thing. So when I moved to Nicaragua and I started blending, it was always six by fifty two. Okay. That's yeah. that's what all the sam original samples I started, I would start there. And then okay. when it got to that when it got to that stage of actually having you know, we want to make, you know, pressed proper samples, right? Six by 52 was always the size. Cause from there right. I can then really feel where we're at from the filler tobaccos. Yeah. You know, I'm already, I'm already there. I'm, I'm already get, you know, have a sense of where we're at from smoking the wrapper, the binders and your fillers. But then when you put it all together, that size has just always been the size for me. That's okay. uh, that's where it always well, starts. And that's really interesting because, like, when I first started trying, like, Tabernacle, Broadleaf, and yeah. then I would buy it by the box, it was always the double Corona Doble, with the 7x54. Yeah. Which is a great size. That size is – I can I, – I've never seen anything like it. The, we sell so many Tabernacle Double Coronas. It's amazing. Um, and I <laughs> – I totally get it too, because it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I mean, as far as you have the time, it's, uh, yeah, huh? it's unbelievable. I got a friend of mine. He's, he's trying to get the, uh, the link to the podcast. So I got to text him this right now. Um, <laughs> no worries. Sorry for this guys. Um, he's trying to call well, me and, too. We'll do this. It, and kind of how thing. you're saying with like, if you have the time, like it just, it opens up as you continue to smoke it. The strength is perfect. The flavor ratio is great. It just, yeah. it really, yeah, it really pops. It's a good size. Let me tell you, it just keeps going. Um, it just keeps going and going. And that size, man. Yeah. If you have the time and you haven't tried the double Corona, I don't know why I shouldn't be provoking this right now. Cause we can't, <laughs> we can't, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's such a great thing. Yeah, it's just basically you're getting, you know, the Toro. Uh, you're getting the, the, you're getting the full novel there. You know, yeah. it's not. Yeah. Uh, you're getting the. You're getting an even longer story, and it's it's just got so much depth and complexity and richness. But again, for me, which has always been the the key is is getting that balance in there at the same time. You know, I do mm -hmm. like fuller body stuff. I do like strength. I do like all that. But the balance is is where yeah. it's at. And the balance yeah. is what's the difficult part, right? It's easy right. to potentially blend a really strong cigar. You throw a bunch of Ligero mm -hmm. and Viso in there. You use some, you know, heavier growing regions. But to really get everything to 
marry together and create mm-hmm. this symphony uh, and this story of flavor without it jading your palate is is definitely the trick. Yeah, uh, well, and I mean, even trying, I mean, I won't name any brands, but trying some recent brands that it's like, you know, this is the heavy hitting, kicky in the teeth cigar, but the yeah, flavor yeah. is like, I'm not, I'm not having much flavor to this. I, I feel like a good balance of one of those cigars that it's noted for its strength, but also flavors like uh, something coming from Southern Draw, like the the, the Jacob's Ladder. It's got this good yeah, balance yeah. to it. Um, and and Foundation Cigars across the board is one of those things to where there is always a new flavor or some some type of flavor in there. The complexity is just in there. Yeah. And you want that, you know, you're, I don't like cigars and certain tobaccos to dry out your palate. I want it, yeah. you know, really salivating, you know, and, and, and not really, and again, jading your palate in any way. That's the, that's the term I use a lot because that's, <laughs> that becomes a, uh, it's, you know, but again, everybody likes something different. So there's a place for yeah. strength. There's a place for, right. you know, I'm not trying to, to knock it. And, 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 and my old cigar, some guys, you know, some guys, sometimes guys are hesitant when they like a mild cigar to say it or something. They enjoy mild I mean, mild cigars are probably the most consumed cigars as right. All right. cigars are, yeah. are milder cigars, Connecticut shade cigars. So it's it's really about what you enjoy, and yeah. that's what I'm trying to accomplish with the portfolio of, yeah. of blends. Is you know, you as a retailer, you get all different people that are coming through that door. They right. like different things. Right. If you only had foundation in the humidor, do you have something for everybody? And that's right. what I tra- really tried to create from price points to blends and everything yeah. in between our infused line is to have something for all these, these different palettes. And I personally, you know, do enjoy different things at different times. I mean, yeah, yeah. I've been smoking, you know, high clear Victorians, Robustos. Like I, I get, you know, I'm also always quality control testing and, and, right. and trying things. Um, you know, recently, you know, I'll have, I'll have boxes that I'll just, you know, smoke through. And then I'm testing other stuff, but well, Wednesday, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's just a solid. I mean, it's just like cedar spice and everything right. nice. That's what we <laughs> Wednesdays are made of. Uh, <laughs> well, and yeah. we have, we have a, a question on that. Both Tabernacle Lanceros are amazing. Is it harder to blend for a smaller ring gauge when you're dealing with a Lancero oh, or something? Especially for that, those types of tobaccos, when you're dealing with heavier leaves that have a, a more of a vein structure and a heavier leaf. And, and if you ever seen some of these, you know, Ligeros or Vizos, um, you know, they're really thick. So to get them in a, you know, to get really thick tobacco into that 40, that's why I couldn't do a 38 ring gauge. It's just really too small for those blends, filler tobaccos yeah. to be using yeah. in, and that, and then it does become um, more difficult to roll that. Yeah, you know, those thicker tobaccos. So yeah, it's you, you have combustion issues, challenge. plug issues. Yeah, yeah, it can go awry. I mean, so you gotta, you know, have have your proper team rolling and bunching up, and right. you know, you got to be really really sharp with the blend too. That the blend, right. you know, is on point because you're not working with much. You're, you're not. Yeah. You're not working yeah. with. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, and, and another question I would have is, is do you, when you, when you're, I say blending or smoking regularly, do you smoke other people's stuff? And if so, is there any other brands that you really enjoy? Well, you know, I don't get to smoke as much uh, uh, of other people's brands as I would like to, because I'm just such a lunatic when it comes to, you know, we're producing so many cigars. So I'm yeah. trying, I'm always trying to <laughs> sample you know, make sure batches are, are on point and everything's consistent. Uh-huh. So a lot of times as I get through them, it's like um, I'm smoked out. But when I do, <laughs> you know, I do love Dion stuff from Illusion. I'm a, okay. I'm a big fan of his stuff. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan of Pete's stuff. I'm a huge Padron, Padron guy. I've always been a okay. Padron guy. Um, yeah. You know, I've been a Fuente guy because I remember all these these brands, you know, some of, some of these brands, 
not not Padron Fuente, of course, but some uh, some of the other brands that I talk to, I'm always talking like from 1996, and guys are like, "What? Like, what are you? Those cigars <laughs> maybe might not be as good today, but um, yeah, I mean, and and I always, you know, smoke things that um, you know friends recommend or they say you got to try this. Last last week, uh, week and a half ago, my good buddy Eric um, had. I don't smoke Cubans off often. You know, he had a beautiful Bolivar uh, Bellicoso Fino. I got to say, it was probably one of the best I've, Cubans I've smoked in a long while. But again, it, okay. you know, I smoked another one and it wasn't consistent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it's a fascinating. The, the Cubans yeah. are fascinating. Okay. I want somebody to do like a brand study on Cuban. There's, it's amazing to me that they, they still have this mystique of – top quality but every cigar smoker you smoke you talk to that smokes cubans like five boxes the five cigars per box just consistently you know just don't smoke and i'm like man yeah yeah i don't know how you guys still associate this with like top quality <laughs> if you know right. and you're spending right. like crazy money uh it would mm -hmm. never hold up in in the u.s market but you know yeah, it's it, it's an amazing. I want somebody to do like a Harvard business study on like <laughs> the, the, this fact. Like, I don't. Know. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Man. What what yeah. what's what's surrounding the Cuban mystique of it? Well, a, yeah, a, it's you interesting. Can't get a really, them. I mean, that's. The, I don't know if yeah. you have tried um, much of Black Label Trading Company stuff. By James Brown. Brown. James, man, James is, uh, it's, I mean, that's got to be one of the coolest names ever. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's a lucky man. He's got a cool name. Uh, <laughs> man, I remember meeting James and, and uh, his wife when, you know, he, he first, first started. And I can't say I've smoked a lot of his stuff. Okay. You know? um, his, I his, wish, um, yeah. I was going to say his Connecticut, his porcelain Connecticut uses a yeah. Pennsylvanian broadleaf binder. And oh, it, cool. it it is a phenomenal Connecticut cigar. And the wrapper is what? Connecticut shade? Connecticut shade, yeah. Oh, that's cool. I'm gonna try that. Yeah, it's yeah. really it's really interesting. It's a good one. Um yeah, and then I another like, question. I admire I, those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Another question I would have is uh how many cigars would you say on average do you suppose that you smoke a day? I don't think I can say that for insurance purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how many, how many, I don't know. I got, man, if I can only show you my situation here, I'm probably smoking too much. You know, I haven't been drinking over COVID, but I have been smoking between my pipe and then, yeah. um, man, I don't know what a number would be. Let me say five. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we have, we have talked to a few people and they're in the tens to fifteens. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't count a lot of, sometimes I'll, you know, specifically be smoking to test. So I'm, yeah. I'm trying yeah. to hit up more volume from different batches. So that's happening. So I won't smoke the whole thing, you know, from beginning to right. end, but right. Beginning to end solid daily, probably, you know, five right now plus the pipe. okay okay yeah, yeah. yeah well and and, and the and, other ones yeah and, and not to put you on the spot because this is one of the hardest questions and it's, it's me on the spot <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll decline answering it if, I, if it's, <laughs> it's bad it's definitely in the crowd you got people listening there right right in front of you there's guys in the in the crowd oh yeah oh yeah oh, oh we got yeah. a packed house here yeah <laughs> oh awesome i didn't even know what's up everybody oh <laughs> Hey, what's and going on? Can they hear we, me? Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. We're all we're all listening. So I mean, this these these answers count. So <laughs> West Side. <laughs> so uh, it, it's kind of asking almost like who's your favorite child. But if you had to pick oh, one of your gosh. most favorite blends, what would you say yeah. is at, at kind of your top? If you could, if if that's too difficult, maybe like top two or three. It's not too difficult, but I don't like to sway people because then, you know, uh, listen, if I'm stuck on a stranded island, I would, if Tabernacle is, you know, I mean, Tabernacle is, is definitely, okay. it's, it's a special, it's a special one for me, you know, from, 
the blend to the to the branding part of it um it's definitely special but like you said they're all they're all spe they all are my children and and right right in many ways so but yeah tabernacle because of the broadleaf you know it's definitely it's definitely up there but again i have time periods i, I you know where i'm going yeah. through and you know now it's 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 what wednesday i mean these things it was high clear robustos last i mean that cigar is that cigar is a that cigar is pretty amazing <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I don't say so, if I do say so myself, and then you know the the David is the David's the David's wow yeah, yeah. it's it's a hard question for sure yeah. David <laughs> well, and then you know, even, in the morning with coffee too I mean oh my god when when you release like the High Claire then there's yeah. also I mean I, the history behind it and all that but at the same time you have the the gin that was also coming out of. The, the same like the high clear castle yeah people don't realize like they when high clear first came out i think they thought it was like a gimmick or something maybe but <laughs> then they it's like no we don't do gimmicks here um <laughs> you know my buddy d distilled moonshine in Connecticut. you can't make up these stories that's why it's like um and, and there's a little there's depth to the story but the short story is my buddy Adam here in Connecticut owned a, a, a moonshine company. So he was distilling moonshine. His family was in the moonshine distilling business back in, you know, the prohibition era. And, and him and his wife went to High Clare on a trip. They end up befriending Lord and Lady Carnarvon, you know, just exchanging emails. And then, you know, just unbelievable this this relationship that developed. So they started working on a gin. This was okay. years ago. It was at the beginning stages of, you know, of developing the idea. And during the discussions, cigars, of course, came up at one point. And my yeah. buddy Adam is like, "I, uh, you got to meet Nick, my buddy Nick. He lives in Nicaragua and he's, he's makes cigars. And, you know, Adam was a cigar smoker, but he, he really wasn't into it as much as okay. of course he is now he was yeah. really just starting to do a deep dive because we met and we met through a, a mutual friend of ours that owns a, a cigar store here in connecticut called mickey blake's and um his name was lou he was just like you guys got to meet each other that was like six years he's like you guys got to know each other and then we became friends and then a couple years later adam's like hey man um you know, I'm working on this gin project and, and Lord Carnarvon started telling me about the history of cigar smoking at the castle. It's like, can you come to London? Can you come to England? And this, I'm like, Adam, it's May. We're preparing for our trade show. Uh, yeah, it's going to be tough. I'm not going to be able to get there. Lord Carnarvon and Adam end up flying to Nicaragua to meet with me because I couldn't make it. Wow. You know, and this is you know, people that know me, uh, you know, I, I do I like nice things? Yes, but like money doesn't impress me. You know, these kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's more of working with the right people and and the right you know character yeah. people and yeah. And so I was a little you know hesitant at first, but the fact that they you know we're going to come to Nicaragua was was just amazing to me. And Lord Carnarvon and I met. And we just hit it off, man. He was just really down to earth. You know, Britain, a whole different culture, really amazing dry sense of humor. But we just hit it off. And I just started learning about, you know, the history at High Clare of cigar smoking. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of years. And, and yeah. you know, every yeah. dinner ended, you know, in the smoking room at the castle. And, you know, his great grandfather was a huge cigar smoker, discovered King Tut's tomb with Howard Carter. And at that point I was done, you know, I was sold out. <laughs> I was sold out after that. So I had made up some blends, of course, you know, when they came down and it just really, you know, happened naturally. I mean, you know, and, and they saw what we were doing as far as, you know, at our trade show booth and, you know, a little bit, you know, we like traditional, but we also like, you know, different edgy things. Yeah. And they were just, they were just all about it. You know, it wasn't about just money or, or, you know, business. It was about this just connection, uh, over cigars. And, um, it's a, yeah, 
it's a real honor to 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 be working with with high claire and yeah. um yeah it's pretty it's pretty awesome so I, I had the chance of going there eventually and and we launched the cigar um in england there and they had an amazing you know event for for high claire castle gin which they're distributing now nationwide and you know they have a full replica of king tut's tomb in the in the basement of high claire next to the wine cellar where we store the cigars um you can't make this up i mean i feel like i'm yeah living in a dream and it it fit really well into the portfolio because there's history there's culture in all of yeah. these, these brands and high claire is is that you know it's it's yeah. living history and culture so i really wanted to have a brand that was again talking about that por portfolio is that ultra luxury you know yeah. high-end brands and what what better than high claire to do that i mean yeah definitely it, yeah so <laughs> definitely I lost you there. well you, i you mean there? i would like to think yeah no no i got you okay. um I, I'd, li I'd like to thank you for joining us on Nick um, and spending the My time pleasure. with us. And, and, and I mean, with the blends across the board, I mean, for me, it's like, I, I can't, I can't, when I think of foundation, I always think of, of uh, tabernacle, but honestly yeah. the, the wise man Maduro really just kind of hit the, the, for my palate, it just kind of hit the spot. The wise man is, you know, for those who go or don't go by cigar fishing, you know, we, we got a 95 for the wise man. Maduro, number three cigar of the year for that. For me, it was, I mean, you know, great. When you, when you started smoking in the nineties, cigar aficionado was, was the, you know, it's the Bible. So yeah. <laughs> to be recognized, to be recognized from going to the store, you know, and then we got in the same year, we got charter Oak as number one, best value cigar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the same, the same year. So it was uh, well, a huge and, honor. And and you think of tobaccos like Connecticut broadleaf and value don't really mesh normally. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, you know, again, it depends on what you're, we, we do use it for the charter Oak Maduro, which is, mm -hmm. you right. know, which is, um, again, just, it is an amazing, amazing cigar for the value uh, yeah. of what charter yeah. is, but you know, and we tried to offer within the charter Oak, the shade, the Maduro, and we, we introduced the Habano last last year, which if you haven't tried the um, if you haven't tried the torpedo charter oak habano, highly recommend it. It's a 50 okay. count cab. Um, yeah. the torpedo it turns out, you know, this is brings brings me back to my nineties. My torpedo six by fifty two torpedo was like when I was coming up in the industry, that was the size. Okay. But, you know, it's like, that was the staple. Cause it was like money, money. Number two torpedo is the, the state opus number two. So that size I've always wanted to do, you know, more in a, a charter, like that 50 count cab. I love that 50 count cab box. I mean, you get a lot of great sticks for a good price. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Now I'm really rambling. I can only see <laughs> no, the faces no. of your guests there. Have, they, well, no, have, get, have your guests been asking questions, or are these different guys online that are asking questions? It's it's mostly guys uh, online. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, and and I mean, I I think that every time that I've been able to sit down and talk with you, I mean, it's been very limited, but it's just the the knowledge behind the tobacco and the blending process is what is always so fascinating to me, which yeah, I really cool. really enjoy. I got a name drop. You know who's been smoking Wise Man Maduro's like mad? Huh? Any Joe Rogan fans over there? <laughs> Joe Rogan is like been smoking Wise Man Maduro's like like cotton candy. Well, and, and I've seen a lot of your posts recently too. You even did like a like a signature Joe Rogan box, right? Oh, wait till you see what's about to happen. <laughs> I, I, mean, I hope Joe shows it, but yeah, no, he. He, um, he, it's, it's been crazy, man. He's been just totally unsolicited, just representing foundation, That's man. Great. He's got, That's he's great. had our ashtray on the table since September 11th. That was the first episode. Wow. It's just been in the center of every guest and, and our cutter. 
And um, I got them a, a beautiful uh, humidor with the American flag, which you'll see in the back by the TV. Um, and yeah, my, my team did some hand painted boxes for him. And um, that's awesome. He recently got some special treats. Um, we'll see. Uh, keep on the lookout. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe he'll show them. But it's been, you know, for me, having Joe get, get into I've been listening to Joe since you know, 2012, but to have someone on his level, you know, I hope he gets even more into cigars because I think it's an important, um, you know, from an industry standpoint also is to yeah. get more of education. That That's my, you know, of course it's, it's great for, for the brands and everything just to have it, it, it exposure for me again, mm -hmm. it's just passion because I, yeah. I, I love the show. I love everything he's doing, but you know, for him, yeah, I'm hoping to get into the next level and really understand kind of the challenges we're facing from, you know, a legislative standpoint, you know, yeah, FDA definitely. standpoint. For right, me, right. it's so important moving forward that we we continue education to non-smokers. That's really the difference between handmade cigars and, you know, machine-made you know, cigarettes and all that right. other stuff. Right. I think that's yeah. just so important. So I'm hoping yeah. at some point, you know, Joe gets into it a little bit more and, and yeah. maybe yeah. helps bring some awareness about the handmade cigars. We have a question of, does Joe Rogan have a particular size that he likes to smoke? He's been smoking the, the wise man Maduro Robustos, man. He's been pretty, okay. he smoked some Davids. Um, and um i did make a special something special for him um which he hasn't smoked <laughs> yet but he seems to be really enjoying the wise man maduros man he's yeah he's okay. you know it's cool because he's been giving them to guests too and you know some of them i think are are, are more experienced smokers than others mm -hmm. but they all seem to again be be really enjoying it because the blends again are for someone that smokes, you know, more often like yourself, it's there, it's the flavors there. It's still, but again, for somebody that's a milder smoker, it's not overpowering. It's not, yeah. it's, gonna, it's yeah. not going to tear apart their, their, uh, their palate. Um, right. Right. Someone's asking me, how did I make the connection? I'm a stalker. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, through a good friend of mine, Eric, he he made he made it happen, and there's a, a few random things that just happened and and brought the connection together. Uh, nice, that sort of solidified uh, solidified it. So it was cool. Yeah. He sent me a he started following us on Instagram and uh, sent me a message a couple couple nights ago. So it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. he's a cool well, dude. And 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 for those watching, once again, we have the the ultimate foundation sampler which includes nick's five-year will wednesday his david his goliath as well as the wiseman maduro and a bunch of other cigars we're talking about you can go to our website you can get the uh, sampler right now and a chance to win a foundation uh hat as well so i don't know how you have these anyway so i don't know how you still have five <laughs> years in any of them so this is not a sales pitch but um <laughs> there's not many people that do have five years still so if you haven't don't sleep on them. <laughs> Definitely. Don't. Well, awesome. Yeah. Th thank you so much, uh, Nick, for My joining pleasure. us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been great. And um, I mean, yeah. not, not also not a sales pitch, but you know, if you ever want to come out to California, we'll Listen, find a way to make it happen. <laughs> it's going to happen at some point. You know, I'm going to be in Nicaragua a lot um, just because this has actually been the longest I've been out of Nicaragua in like 18 years. But um if I head that way, I got. We'll, we'll we'll do this in person at some point. Awesome, awesome. Well, right. thank you so much, and you take right. it easy. And thanks for being with All us. Right. Please thank everybody that's that's uh, chilling tonight, and I appreciate everybody. Thank you for the support. Without you guys, we don't exist. So, Smoke Foundation. Definitely, definitely. Thank you All again. Right, guys.